Hello everybody, my name is Kurt Galloff. Together with Christian Behrendt, I'm going to present about our project, Sovereign Cloud Stack, which is about building large federated infrastructure for sovereignty. So what is the problem we're trying to solve? Looking at Europe and our path to digitalization, there are a few challenges that developers meet when they're trying to build software. Uh, very often we still see in Europe a rather classical development and production environments. Um, these are typically bare metal or sometimes uh, virtualized systems that are managed by the IT department. They're well protected, they are in-house, so you have no trouble with uh, um, data being submitted to uh, unwanted places. And if you're lucky, your IT department has still enough staff to really uh, provide good support to you as an engineer. Um, however, um, you do have to work with uh, proprietary tooling uh, or sometimes homegrown tooling that uh, allows you to access uh, such infrastructure. Uh, it typically comes with slow and manual deployment processes, so it's not really following the modern infrastructure as code principles. And uh, very often uh, you need to actually procure new hardware or get approvals for uh, even getting a virtual machine being deployed and those are even uh, slower. They really slow you down in your development process. On the other hand, uh, a lot of companies obviously have made the move to an agile um, CICD uh, style of development. They typically work on hyperscalers. You can use the full automation uh, of such hyperscaler infrastructure. It's API driven and you can really use uh, best of class DevOps or DevSecOps uh, operations principles. Typically, these infrastructures also come with a number of ready-to-use building blocks, and there's a significant set of open source tooling around them. Sometimes it's not really open source. Um, disadvantages of this is obviously um, once uh, you're starting to use these hyperscalers and you're not very careful in managing uh, what technologies you use and how you use them, you easily end up with very hard dependencies that are very difficult to get out. Um, these can turn out to be expensive, so it's really disadvantageous in an economic sense. It can also be a problem in a strategic sense um, or a legal sense, because of course in Europe you have to obey to the GDPR, the data protection rules, um, and uh, this is not easy. And just recently the highest European court has ruled that uh, there is trouble. The privacy shield is certainly not enough. Uh, to protect uh, personal data that is transmitted to the US uh, from uh, being spied on. Uh, fulfilling the GDPR regulation requires more effort there. Uh, a number of uh, European companies actually have gone down uh, the way of using uh, smaller European providers or built their own infrastructure as code platforms. Uh, so you can deliver to your engineers, to your software developers, uh, full API-driven automation. You're rather flexible in how you do that. The trouble with that is you end up with a non-standardized niche solution. And um, this is not very efficient in the long term because uh, you need really expensive and scarce skills to operate such infrastructure well in a very reliable, high quality manner. Uh, in addition, uh, all the building blocks you want, uh, you need to build yourself because you're not on top of a standard platform. Um, you cannot do some cloud bursting and basically consume resources from some other cloud because you're on your own, you've built your own platform. Um, so Gaia-X uh, wants to support the uh, digitalization in Europe. It's a project that has been started by the German Ministry for um, economy and energy um, and it's meanwhile a European initiative um, and the idea behind is that uh, the digital sovereignty uh, for business science and government should be strengthened by uh, supporting digital innovation and it really is about leveraging the value that is in data. Um, one of the things that uh, we want to do differently in Europe uh, compared to what's happening in other geographies in this world is that there's this idea that uh, there should be an ability to leverage and use data without uh, losing complete control over that data. Uh, so there should be an opportunity for people providing data, people using data to do that. 
um, in a way that still allows you to control who has access to it. Uh, the sovereign cloud stack is there to build infrastructure that supports such sovereign data um, usage, such sovereign data processing. Um, and the way we look at this is that we really want the IT landscape to be under the control of the people that provide the data, the people that use it. Uh, and this can be achieved by really having a broad set of providers that deliver such modern agile infrastructure and data services and that they are interoperable and this interoperability can be certified uh, so you can prove it's interoperable. Um, data protection security is right built into the platform and this really supports the innovation. Um, so Sovereign CloudSec really wants to empower developers and users uh, to have access to modern platforms uh, without uh, being or becoming dependent on uh, a small set or a single large provider. So here's what SCS is delivering. It's really about three things, software, standards, ecosystem. So software, uh, that uh, we want to provide as part of the work we're doing in Sovereign Cloud Stack is a complete stack of software that allows you to deliver cloud infrastructure. That uh, includes uh, infrastructure that uh, virtualizes your resources, manages your hardware resources, uh, to provide an infrastructure as a service platform to your users, to provide a Kubernetes as a service platform to your users, and I'm, I'm intentionally saying Kubernetes as a service and not just containers as a service because in the end we think that engineers, developers need control over a Kubernetes cluster, not just access to it. Um, and then optionally uh, over time certainly growing uh, will be certain platform service components that you can use as building blocks uh, to deliver, uh, to basically be more efficient in delivering a higher level services. Uh, one thing we include, and that's maybe different to uh, what some of the existing OpenStack distributions, for example, attempt to do is we have a very strong focus on operations. So lifecycle management tooling is uh, key to what we're doing, uh, delivering uh, CI components that allow the providers to validate uh, updates and upgrades in the infrastructure monitoring uh, is all part of what's a part of our platform. Um, then, importantly, um, we believe uh, if you want to have choice, uh, those operators need to be able to federate with each other. So users that want to use several cloud providers can do so without having to uh, manage users and access rights separately on each of these platforms. Uh, this is core of the GaiaX concept to have federation in there. Um, then. The software we're delivering is modular, so we uh, acknowledge there's existing cloud uh, providers out there, um, sovereign cloud providers even here in Europe, uh, that want to reuse some of the components they already have, and we want to make that possible. Uh, we will look at those components if they are compatible uh, with the way we look at the software stack and the architecture. Uh, they can be used and there's no need to use the complete SCS um, software stack, but of course we still want to deliver a complete stack. Then, um, no surprise probably uh, presenting to this audience is we fully subscribe to the four opens of the open uh, stack and the open infrastructure community. So we are working with open source, uh, we're developing that open source code with open development processes, uh, with open design processes, with an open community. Um, very important to us is uh, standards. So uh, we know there's a lot of uh, great open source software out there that can be combined in many, many, many different ways. And in the end, the fact that uh, each party can um, combine things in, in, in non-standard ways actually hurts uh, the overall success of the, the open source cloud providers. Because in the end, without having a, a certain set of uh, compatibility and standards, uh, each provider ends up delivering a different platform. So we believe there needs to be a, a strong standardization effort here. 
And that really uh, covers all the layers we have in the stack. The infrastructure as a service layer, the Kubernetes layer, uh, the Kubernetes cluster management, um, and then also not just uh, looking at API compatibility, but also uh, looking at the behavior of a platform. So we, for example, what does an availability zone mean exactly is something that needs to be defined here. Um, we also want to work with providers to um, provide operational standards. So if providers um, work with us and want to be uh, SCS certified, we will have some rules in place that define how long it might take to uh, uh, deploy updates. We don't want to have uh, outdated platforms out there, which then just because of being very old, uh, become incompatible with other newer platforms. Uh, things like SLA definitions need to be defined and standardized across the ecosystem. And in the end, of course, we want to make sure that the platform services that are delivered, the uh, infrastructure, the Kubernetes, um, is being discoverable. And uh, one of the very useful tools of the GaiaX uh, project we are using here is the GaiaX self descriptions that help users to um, select and find and identify the platforms and characterize them. Uh, ecosystem building, very important to us. Um, we don't just want to deliver a standard and software and then say, well, hopefully some people will use that and create something useful out of that. We are coming out of the uh, cloud service provider community and we uh, want to work very, very closely with that community and create some uh, sharing that uh, is currently not yet uh, the, the yeah, practice in that space. So we want to make sure that not every cloud service provider needs to learn all those operational challenges, um, those best practices you need to become good in operating such a complex, difficult cloud platform alone, but we really create an open community of cloud providers that share best practices, that share root cause analysis in case of trouble. And we have some transparency on those challenges uh, so we can actually create some joint learning uh, for that community. Obviously, that uh, standardization, that ecosystem also then in the end ends up really being a platform to the um, software vendors, uh, to people that uh, learn how to operate this, to consultants that want to help uh, customers okay. to create software for such a platform. Because if those platforms all are very similar, um, it's a lot easier to really learn how these platforms work and specialize your knowledge and your skills uh, to support that. So this is uh, just a different view on the design, design criteria. I just ran you through standardization, certification, transparency, sustainability, federation. This is really required in our opinion to create a relevant platform. This is how we believe the um, ecosystem should look like. So um, this is a busy picture and I apologize for that. Um, we have uh, like an ecosystem of seven different cloud providers here that collaborate to different degrees. One thing they all have in common is that they all provide uh, a certain set of compatible APIs. If you look at the legend of this picture, um, we see the APIs for the identity and access management. In white, we see the uh, Kubernetes as a service uh, APIs. Uh, they, those are mandatory in the SCS standard. We see the uh, S3 object storage API, which is mandatory part of the standard. Um, this is all provided by all providers. And this uh, makes sure that applications that build on top of these standard APIs really can run without any change and can be automated and deployed without any change on all of those platforms. This uh, applies, for example, to what I've depicted here as the uh, third party SAS application number one on the apps layer here, because it really consumes the standard interfaces only. We also have a set of optional standards. Um, so we believe there will be providers uh, that want to expose the OpenStack APIs, uh, having OpenStack as some of the uh, building blocks uh, that we put below the Kubernetes as a service platform. 
Um, that's an that's an optional piece, but if uh, it is provided, it can be standardized. So applications that want to consume those interfaces uh, can be done in such a way that it then run on all of the uh, SDS providers that provide OpenStack APIs. Um, we also, over time, will have a growing ecosystem of uh, platform as a service applications, and we will uh, slowly, over time, also standardize these. Uh, as soon as those are provided as a standard, um, they are optional standards. So some cloud providers may decide to deliver them, some may not. And of course, the self descriptions will make it easy to discover which ones are available. So applications like the, the red one, the, the SAS2 application here in this picture, that build on top of uh, these uh, optional standards, they will run on a subset of the SCS providers, but it can be found out without testing because just by looking at the self descriptions and discovering the infrastructure, this can be determined and it's important to us. If I look at the uh, various offerings from cloud providers here, you will see some differences in the details. For example, looking at provider number one on the left side, this is actually a provider that has a lot of uh, pre-existing uh, infrastructure already uh, existing. So he builds uh, using the standard SCS uh, Kubernetes as a service pieces on top uh, of his non-standard um, infrastructure as a service. Um, and uh, based on that, he of course cannot expose a standard uh, OpenStack APIs, but he can still deliver standard S3 and uh, Kubernetes or container uh, platform APIs and in this way still be a compatible platform. So this can be certified and can be run and uh, can be consumed by users in, an, in a fully compatible way. Provider 2 is the ideal case from an SCS uh, point of view. Uh, so this is a provider that really consumes all of the SCS uh, standard software, um, also exposing the OpenStack pieces, uh, also exposing standard APIs for the two platform services that we already have standardized in this example. Um, provider number three has a few differences, uh, not exposing OpenStack, not exposing the second uh, pass uh, um, building blocks. And this is also a provider that's actually not a public cloud provider, but this is a provider that really builds um, and provides services just to a limited community, just accepting maybe uh, identities from a specific selected vetted uh, identity provider number two in this picture, uh, and this way limiting access to a certain trusted um, customers. We also have um, examples of providers that are using non-standard uh, pieces in their infrastructure like provider number five. Uh, interestingly, provider number five uh, has a compatible OpenStack uh, implementation in place. Uh, this can be certified uh, by using testing uh, from tests from the SCS uh, community um, and then actually providing a standard interface here. So um, applications that rely on standard uh, OpenStack interfaces actually can run on this platform. Uh, provider number six actually is not a cloud service provider, but it's really an IT department of a large company. Um, building on standard SCS uh, technology, um, but protecting uh, the environment very well because it's only meant to be used internally, so external access is very limited. Provider number seven is uh, even more protected. Uh, this is really something that we imagine to exist in a government uh, environment or maybe even military. Um, it's not uh, connected to the internet, at least not without going through many, many difficult hoops. So from a practical perspective, it looks like a uh, completely separated environment. Um, in that environment, still the uh, IT department running such an environment will benefit from SCS because um, it still allows standard applications that are built for SCS to work without any change and without any special uh, work that needs to be done.